Um, it's really nice to be here and uh, you know I moved to JNU about five months ago and I thought I had come here to teach but it's a new phase of my student life having completed this uh, 23 lectures on uh, what the nation wants to know and thank you Janaki and uh, others not only for organizing these lectures but to Janaki for so beautifully consolidating the intellectual conversations over the last one month. And it's a great moment to welcome Suvir to give the last lecture in this series. And Suvir, of course, is uh, known to most of you. He teaches at uh, UPenn, but is currently uh, with uh, JNIAS as a fellow. And uh, he has, he's a scholar of literature, but looking at literature in relationship to some of the difficult moments in the history of the nation. And his earlier book, The Partitions of Memory, is very well known to us. And the more recent book, uh, Gardens and Graves, Essays and Poems from Kashmir, uh, that's the more recent book. And Suvi will be speaking to us on At the Limits of Postcolonial Nationalism, and an appropriate concluding lecture to this series. Suvi. Thank you, Uday. Thank you all for having me here. I want to begin with a simple expression of solidarity. JNU has, stands right now internationally, and I will elaborate on what that means, for the right to speak, speak loudly and forcefully, speak rationally and with clarity of difficult ideas. All across the world, what you are performing here has galvanized university communities. I know this not only because I've been part of signature campaigns and consciousness raising campaigns in the United States, in other parts of Europe, but also because I was on a recent visit to Bangladesh and I was astonished at a party, not necessarily with academic guests, with common citizens of Bangladesh, the number of them who had actually listened to a great many of these lectures and more important, who had listened to Comrade Kanhaiya's speech when he was released and they kept saying to me, to a point of embarrassment, that they were astonished that such political energy was feasible any longer anywhere in the subcontinent. Now, I was gratified to hear that, and I bring this compliment to you to remind you that what is going on here has ramifications not simply for JNU, not simply for Indian universities, but for universities across the subcontinent and across the world. I also want to say that this is, as you know much better than I do, going to be a very long struggle. So my solidarity and those of people like me with your two comrades who are still in jail and indeed with the many of you who face the threat of administrative action. You must not back down. I know you won't. And I know you won't. And there will be a great many of us joining with you. I should move now to my lecture, though I have to say that my friend and colleague Janaki did such an incredible job of summarizing the wealth of material you have been exposed to that it is plain and simple intimidating. To be asked to add to that remarkable range of ideas is near impossible, though I will say one thing. I can't shake the irony that all the pitfalls the possibilities, the magnificence, the disasters of Indian nationalism have been described in their glorious detail well before the Kashmiri has spoken. <laughs> so, uh, having said that, my title asks us to think a little more closely, and I know other people have in, these, in this series have asked you to address the same term, have asked, you, uh, asked us to think more closely about the term colonial and indeed about the term post-colonial. As all of you know, at a simple conversational level, the word post is meant to mark a major breach. That was the colonial period, the period of empire, the period of imperialism. Now we live in a post-colonial uh, period where an independent, na independent nation forges its own assumptions about what constitutes justice, what constitutes an appropriate uh, future, what constitutes the participation of citizenship in an inclusive democracy. Also, that understanding of the term post asks of us. But the term post doesn't mark, as we well know, a breach. 
it also marks continuities. To that extent, the term post derives a great deal from, of its force and its historical power from another term that is often used to describe the transition between the British Empire and India as a part of that British Empire and independent India, which is the transfer of power. No matter how much we celebrate the post that nationalists achieved when they moved us as an entity towards freedom, we are always dealing with the uncomfortable fact that what we saw happening in 47, in the prelude to 47, and in the years after, was actually a systematic transfer of power between colonial elites and post-colonial elites. Now, nothing I'm saying here is news to you. All of you in your daily lives, as also in your academic reading, know that this is the case. All of you have been dealing with what begins as this entire JNU problem, if I can call it that, or the entire JNU possibility, begins in the fact that an act of sedition was invoked in order to shut up a group of students who were doing what students on a campus should feel entitled to do. Raise slogans, debate ideas, quarrel publicly about what they value in the nature of their public lives. All of you, I'm sure, have heard more than once about the history of uh, these acts of sedition. As you know, it's a colonial act that the post-colonial government, the independent government of India, has refused to remove from its statute books from the IPC, regardless of the fact that judge after judge at the high court level and mostly at the Supreme Court level have basically suggested that this act of sedition ought to have no place in our rule books. But there is an even longer history that gets left out of this conception of a 19th century British colonial act that is carried into independent India. And this takes us back to the year 1661 and the re restoration of Charles II. You will remember that in the middle of the 17th century, and I'm going to sp spend the next few minutes talking a little about British history, that in the middle of the 17th century, uh, there was essentially a revolution that dethroned and then decapitated a king. Given the context of 18th, uh, 17th century insurrections, this was an astonishing, in its own way, world-creating idea at that point. But in 1661, with the restoration of Charles II, what was promulgated, one of the first acts that the British Parliament that convened to welcome him to England, what it promulgated was, and I'm going to quote the full title of this act, an act for safety and preservation of his majesty's person and government against treasonable and seditious practices and attempts. This is the logic of a monarchy reasserting its absolutist authority that we have inherited via our British administrators. This is the act that has been used against, as you know, not only your com comrades from this uh, uh, campus, but uh, against a great many other Indians in vulnerable situations. I will al also remind you that Hardik Patel, no matter what his politics, is also in jail on charges of sedition. So this is an act, an IPC act that has been used at will to go after not simply the vulnerable, but anybody who might become potentially a threat or a challenge to state power. So one of the long-term struggles that all of us have to engage in, and this too is part of my understanding of what it means to work towards a genuinely post-colonial judicial apparatus, is to try and get rid of this act. The courts, I have no idea how long the, the courts will continue to in their own small ways, support individuals against the state. But the only solution really is to get ourselves into a point where we no longer have to worry about the might of the state and its minions, including those in university administrations who seem to forget what their job is as faculty. <clears throat> I am also particularly grateful uh, to JNU for having allowed us to think once again about Kashmir. I know this is an extraordinary complex idea, 
But the importance of JNU is that you have allowed a conversation, initiated a conversation, however broken, however put down, you have initiated a conversation about Kashmir that is not permissible anywhere in Kashmir. I hope all of you are aware, I'm sure you are, that anyone in Kashmir, especially in the universities, who has asked any question about the administration and its use of power, the government and its use of power, and it doesn't matter who's in power there, which mainstream political parties in power, they've all been quick to use the Public Safety Act to lock people up. And this Public Safety Act, like the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, both of these are, of course, powers or that drew their legitimacy and their historical legacy from colonial laws. You will remember, I'm sure several of you who know this kind of uh, legal history better than I do, that it was Lord Linlithgow who, was, who promulgated the first Armed Forces Special Powers Ordinance. And he did so precisely because Gandhi and the national movement were becoming very difficult for him to handle. That is the AFSPA that the post-colonial government confirmed in order for it to send in the military in Nagaland, in Manipur, in various parts of the, including in Tripura. But also certainly that's the act that continues to allow all manner of military uh, impunity in Kashmir. These are some of the ways in which our institutional structures inhabit the world of colonial, not of post-colonial thinking. Indeed, for me, the even more challenging idea is that of the hold of empire on the modern political imagination. We all believe that the moment of the decolonization has come and gone. We all hope for, and sometimes we presume, that our political imaginations have found a kind of emancipatory vocabulary that no longer is in the thrall of colonial conceptions, of imperial conceptions of the importance of na nation states or indeed about the importance of particular forms of citizenship. You will all remember that in the empire we were subjects, not citizens. That transition is an enormously difficult transition as we see. It cannot be made simply at the level of form, simply at the level of uh, language. Speaker after speaker has informed you that democracy, democratic thought, democratic practice is an ongoing process. It has to be reaffirmed in everyday choices, but it also has to be reaffirmed in the nature of the experiences you are allowed to have. It cannot be blunted and denied with the forceful ease with which government after government seems to want to do it. So part of what I wanted to remind us about here is that a post-colonial nation, in the sense of it being always a, a nation in the making, it's a nation always in the making, never perfect, never arrived at, because it is the product of an everyday tension between democracy and nationalism. This for me is one of the cardinal principles that guides my political optimism and my political hope. I keep imagining that all of us know those moments in everyday life, in the life of individuals or in the life of communities, where democratic aspiration rubs up against the instruments of nationalism and questions those nationalisms. Those are the moments where difficulty emerges. Those are the moments where political possibility emerges. Now, I'm doing this at a very abstract level, but I wanted to flesh it out a little by calling attention to my own experiences as a Kashmiri of life in Kashmir. I didn't grow up there. I grew up in Bengal, though Kashmir was always home. These are issues I have uh, developed at greater length in the book that uh, Professor Uday Kumar mentioned of gardens and graves, uh, which is my attempt to come to terms with what has been happening in Kashmir, not only in the last 25 or 26 years, but in the lead up to what we can today think of as the problem of Jammu and Kashmir. I didn't grow up in Kashmir. I grew up in Bengal, but Kashmir was always home because my grandparents uh, had homes there. In fact, they had identical homes next to each other. I would always visit over the summer. 
1989, in January 1919, as you know, in the face of an armed insurrection, there was a massive governmental crackdown. Kashmir changed, Srinagar changed in a way that it hadn't before. Nobody went. My father went back to check up on our house for two or three years after, but there was a long period, almost a decade, when nobody went home to our uh, homes in Srinagar. But in 2003, when, the, when, when political events there seemed calmer, and the insurgency seemed to have been, and I'm using the vocabulary that is used by the state and by newspapers, when the insurgency seemed to have been checked, we went back to try and revive our house there. Everyone, all our neighbors, and here I will identify them as Muslim because they had continued to live there where the largest number of the pundits had left. Every one of our neighbors said that things were so much better than in 2003. And I remember walking around that city and wondering how this constituted, how what I was seeing there constituted being better. It was an armed encampment Certain parts of uh, Srinagar continue to be an armed encampment even today. But in 2003, you could not go anywhere in the city without seeing automatic weapons carrying either BSF or CRPF uh, police, uh, military police, all across the city, every 150 yards. There were two. One of the reasons, oddly enough, our house was untouched because the two major entry points into this neighborhood had enormous bunkers. So nobody came and went from that neighborhood without uh, fear of being questioned or worse. And that's the moment at which I began to wonder, as somebody who had easily, effortlessly thought of himself as both Indian and Kashmiri, about what it means to live in a situation where all my democratic beliefs in being Indian were up against what I was seeing, my experience of life in Kashmir. I was enormously troubled, as you can imagine, by what I saw there and by what I heard, and by the fact that every time I expressed my sympathy with what was the visible oppression of people around me, my neighbors would say, no, no, you mustn't feel badly. We know what happened with you people. But I was always in an anomalous situation. I was one of those notionally a pundit, one of those families who had left in uh, 1990. But in fact, I hadn't. I was always a visitor. And it is out of my troubled feeling then that I began to try and read. It's easy enough to think when you're growing up in India or you're growing up in Kashmir, if you're growing up Indian and Kashmiri, to think you know enough about the history of Kashmir to recognize that something enormously had gone wrong. As a matter of fact, I knew nothing, and I am certainly better educated than most. It took an enormous amount of work for me, and conversations, 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 most, important, most importantly, empathetic conversations with people around me. It took an enormous amount of work for me to read against my own sense that I understood the history of Kashmir, not just what had happened in 1947, right after independence, including the instrument of accession signed by the Maharaja, handing over um, uh, authority over Jammu and Kashmir in the face of tribal in invaders from Pakistan to the Indian army, which landed there. It's a f I discovered a far more complicated history. But I also discovered a much worse picture of Indian parliamentary democracy or electoral democracy that I could have imagined. Almost every one of the early elections in Jammu and Kashmir, especially in the seats in Kashmir, were rigged, by which I mean candidates were elected unopposed. If you as a candidate decided to turn in your uh, papers uh, to the election commission, unless you had been pre-approved, there was no chance that you would even be allowed to stand for elections. So on the face of it, for three decades and more, India could claim to the world, and indeed could claim to itself, that elections were being conducted in Kashmir with great regularity. And it was only a fringe group of people who were not acknowledging India's political and moral legitimacy. As it turns out, electoral democracy was precisely the facade under which Kashmiri political opinion, particularly Muslim uh, political opinion, was being marginalized entirely. 
Now, this complicates my understanding, and I would recommend that it should complicate our understanding of the ease with which we think of Kashmir as an atut ang of this nation. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean even for a moment that I have got to a comfortable position where I can say, because I believe in the principle of self-determination, I know what the future of Kashmir can be. I don't have any longer the right to know that. And I would recommend that for all of us as Democrats, that we do not have the a priori right to decide how a people or a community should think about their political future. But it is our, but it is our political responsibility, particularly our political responsibility as teachers and as students, to argue that that conversation about Kashmir, its future, its past, its present, must happen. And it must happen in places like this because this government and many others like it will not let it happen anywhere else. So it becomes our responsibility and it becomes our right to have that conversation. And that is partly what JNU has allowed to happen. Believe me, these conversations, as I began by saying, are resonating across the globe. For all their pitfalls and their difficulties, there should not be a single line. And I know that JNU believes in the multiplicity of voices that should debate these questions. I'm not for a second arguing that JNU Students Union or uh, the faculty community at large should come up with a line on Kashmir. Not at all. What is important is that these conversations, these difficult conversations should happen and that they should become part and parcel of our understanding of a much broader national conception. That for me is what a genuinely post-colonial nationalism will make available to us, at least the possibility of political debate about the flashpoints in our democracy, not just in our nation, but in our democracy. I want to also ask us, and this I'm asking almost as a kind of theoretical challenge, for the young people at JNU, because we, people like me who did not grow up as colonial subjects, who were born when India became independent, we grew up, we learned, we were proud of a really powerful legacy of anti-colonial nationalism. That legacy unfortunately blunted our awareness of those many parts of this country where there were struggles that predated Gandhian nationalism or predated the Gandhian national movement and which had continued to be marginalized in independent India. It took my generation a long time to even recognize what we had not been able to see because we were so much the beneficiaries and the legacies of this form of anti-colonial nationalism with all its celebratory overtones. Now, I worry, as all of you do, and as Professor Janki Nair said, a great many of your speakers worried about the history of that nationalism because it turns out to be, if not a coercive history, very often it is a coercive history, it turns out to be a history that marginalizes many communities. So my challenge to you, your generation, is what kind of nationalism should we attempt to replace it with? Or is the term nationalism, the idea of nationalism, the political mobilizatory power of nationalism so necessarily tainted that there is no possibility of doing anything but refusing it at every point? And there is a reason why I'm asking this question because I know that this will be your challenge in the years ahead. It will be our challenge too, but it will be your challenge for longer and perhaps you will be able to think about it more creatively. Many years ago, when Mrs. Thatcher, Prime Minister Thatcher in England, won two elections, a great many people wondered about one astonishing fact. The English laboring classes, the English working classes, seem to have voted enormously in large numbers for her. Now, this seemed to be a contradiction in terms. Rather than voting for labor, they were voting for Margaret Thatcher and the Conservatives, her version of the Conservative Party. Now, Stuart Hall, whose work some of you will know, the brilliant Jamaican 
cultural critic who uh, lived his life in the United Kingdom, he asked what seemed to be a deceptively question. Why did that happen? How do you explain the fact that large constituencies, particularly working class constituencies in Britain, who should never have uh, believed in uh, Margaret Thatcher, believed in him? There were at least two arguments that he developed. One was that Margaret Thatcher had tapped into this sense of, in its own ironic way, post-colonial Britain, where a Britain that seemed diminished by the loss of its imperial territories seemed to have very little by way of ideological possibility to offer its citizens. What Margaret Thatcher made available was a enormously powerful, jingoistic, militarized nationalism. All of you will remember the war around the Las Malvinas, the, the islands off the coast of Argentina, where Margaret Thatcher th sent in the British Navy to make sure that Argentina didn't, uh, uh, didn't effect its rightful claim to those islands. That form of jingoistic nationalism is some uh, militarized nationalism is something that is on the rise in India today too. And we have to figure out ways in which to counter it. But there was something else that Stuart Hall uh, argued that has stuck with me all these years. He said the left in England, the broad left, from had too easily evacuated the symbols of patriotism and of nationalism, <laughs> thus allowing Margaret Thatcher and the Tory party to claim their, uh, them as their own. What were these symbols? The Queen, the flag, and the national anthem, the odious rule Britannia, which promises that Britons will never be uh, slaves, and was written at the time when Britain was busy enslaving uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, not only uh, Africans, but people across the world. He pointed out well, what the left had done was not found an equally persuasive set of symbols with which to counter these traditional imperial symbols of British nationality. That, I suspect, is our challenge too at this point. We have resurrected, well, I shouldn't even say the word we, you people have resurrected the term Azadi, and we will be debating it in lectures here the weeks to come. That is a term that potentially has the power to resonate against the insistence on our worshipping Bharat Mata, our saluting the flag, our not even questioning the crores, thousands of crores that are, sent, uh, that are spent on our armies and on our paramilitary apparatus. But it is only one term of a relatively, it's not of recent provenance, but of a relatively recent currency. So it is our challenge, those of us who believe in democratic and progressive thought, to be able to articulate a set of ideas, images, that will be powerful enough to resist the vulgar militarized nationalism centered around particular slogans of that is so a uh, favorite of politicians of all stripes, indeed of administrators of all kinds. So that I offer to you as a challenge. Is there the possibility for us to be able to develop a political imaginary outside of the thrall of empire? Because as far as I'm concerned, our suspicion of the flag and of other national symbols, symbols like that is well-founded. Symbols like this have historically always been used to mobilize majority populations in the service of elite interests. But figuring out ways in which to counter them, persuasive ways in which to counter them, because there is an enormous world of public opinion outside of JNU and outside of our worlds that needs to be educated into these conversations. That too is your challenge. My way of dealing with some of my own demons, the demons of somebody who wishes to be thought of as Indian and democratic while being thought of as Kashmiri, was to look about, write a book about this whole process. That, that entire book really is a story of your challenge. If Kashmir is the flashpoint 
where this entire JNU problem began, you have stumbled upon or you have articulated one of the symptom, what is one of the symptomatically one of the most powerful problems, one of the most powerful articulations of the problem of post-colonial Indian nationalism. How and why and when will we get to a point where we can rid ourselves of the burdens of the imperial nation state formation to a point where we can ask the kinds of questions that will lead to a genuinely egalitarian, inclusive community at the end of it. I'm going to stop talking about nationalism now, but I did want to end by taking us back to a country without a post office, which you will remember is where all of this began. And I thought I would read not all of, because it is a comparatively long poem, but I would read several stanzas from a poem that is contained within the volume of poetry that is A Country Without uh, a Post Office. This is Ara Shahid Ali's wonderful poem, A Pastoral. It is a poem of loss, of longing, but of political hope. And that is why I read it to you, not only to remind you about all that Kashmiris have suffered and continue to suffer, but of political possibility and solidarity after this. Uh, Aga Shahid Ali had dedicated this poem to a Hindu friend of his. This is a pastoral. We shall meet again in Srinagar by the gates of the Villa of Peace, our hands blossoming into fists till the soldiers return the keys and disappear. Again we'll enter our last world, the first that vanished in our absence from the broken city. We'll tear our shirts for tourniquets and bind the open thorns, warm the ivy into roses. Quick, by the pomegranate, the bird will say, humankind can bear everything. This is both our problem and our possibility. Humankind can bear everything. No need to stop the year to stories rumored in branches. This is the invitation. No need to stop our ears to the stories that have circulated to us from the margins of our nation. Pluck the blood. My words will echo thus at, sensor, at sunset by the ivy, but to what purpose? In the drawer of the cedar stand, white in the veranda, we'll find letters. When the post offices died, the mailman knew he'd returned to answer them. Better if he'd let them speed to death, blacked out by the autumn's press trust, not like this, taking away our breath, holding it with love's anonymous scripts. See how your world has cracked. Why aren't you here? Where are you? Come back. Is history death there across the oceans? Is history death there? I'm repeating a line that he doesn't repeat. Is history death there? across the oceans, or indeed across the Pir Panjal Pass. Quick, the bird will say, and we'll try the keys with the first one open the door into the drawing room. Mirror after mirror, textile by dust, will blind us to our return as we light oil lamps. The glass map of our country, still in the wall, will tear us to lace. We'll go past our ancestors, up the staircase, holding their wills against our hearts. Their wish was that we return forever and inherit. Quick, the bird will say, and inherit that to which we belong, not like this, to get news of our deaths after the worlds. On that note, thank you for listening to me, and a great deal of good luck with your struggles ahead. All of us are with you. Thank you, Shella.